Welcome everyone. As we know, governments of more than 190 countries globally have committed to NTB by 2030 by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN General Assembly in September 2015. Not only are governments have committed to NTB by 2030, but the G20 summit convened earlier this month in Germany also reinforced the commitment to improve global response to anti-tuberculosis drug resistance. This commitment to NTB is in line with the WHO NTB strategy, which was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2014. Our Indian government has set the target to end tuberculosis by 2025. One of the Northern Himalayan Indian states, Himachal Pradesh, aspires to end TB by 2021 or 2022. But are we on track to meet these goals and targets? Are TB rates declining fast enough to meet the SDG goals? Well, let us hear what the experts have to say on this today. But before we begin, let me request all participants to please keep sending your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait till the end. Just type your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen screen. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsarup. Ashok Ramsarup is a widely acclaimed international journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Greetings from the from Durban, South Africa, not far from the port city of Durban, we are dealing with the worst known outbreak of XDRTB, the deadliest strain of tuberculosis, the extensively drug resistant type meaning that many antibiotics do not work against it. In 2006, researchers there reported an alarming finding 52 out of 53 patients with both HIV and XDR-TB had died, and half died within a month of getting a diagnosis. Initially, doctors thought most patients had developed XDR-TB because of treatment failure, that they had had regular TB or a slightly drug-resistant version, and because they had either not been prescribed the right drugs or had not taken them all, the infections became resistant to multiple drugs. Instead, they found many patients had never been treated, implying that the deadliest strain was being transmit, transmitted between people. Person-to-person -person transmission could have been prevented if infection control was in place. Undoubtedly, health and non-health sectors both need to collaborate effectively along with other stakeholders, including affected communities, to accelerate efforts to end TB by 2030 or earlier. With this intent, potentially one of the most pivotal meetings happening this year is the WHO Global Ministerial Conference Ending TB in the Sustainable Development Era, a multi-sectoral response which will be held in Moscow, Russia during 16 and 17 November 2017. We have luminary panel experts who will share important insights today. Without any further ado, let me introduce the experts for this first session. Dr. Nguyen Viet and Hung, Director of National Lung Hospital Vietnam and Head of Vietnam National TB Program, member of WHO's Strategic and Technical Advisor Group for TB, STAG TB. President of Vietnam Association Against TB and Lung Diseases, Head of TB and Lung Diseases, Hanoi Medical University, followed by Kavita Ayagari, Head Advocacy Communications and Strategic Partnerships, International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the Union Southeast Asia Office, Kavita is Project Director of USAID Funded Challenge TV based in India. We're getting our third panelist for our webinar today is Nandita Venkatesan. Ms. Venkatesan 
who works with the Economic Times, is a two-time intestinal TB survivor, compatient and advocate from Mumbai. She lost over 90% of her hearing due to a rare side effect of a second-line TB drug. In an eight-year battle, she first got TB in 2007 as an undergraduate student and then suffered a life-threatening reinfection in 2013. She recently gave a TEDx talk on a long ordeal. Well, let's get the show moving. It's Dr. Negwen Viet Nung, Director of National Lung Hospital, Vietnam, and Head of Vietnam's National TB Program. Over to you. The firstly, about the TB epidemiology situation in Vietnam. Vietnam has identified as among 30 uh, country with the high burden TB and MDR TB. That is uh, ranked the 15, as you, you know. And next slide. Next, please. And next. Here you see the recently with the notification that means the number of the patient detected by uh, our program and the treatment outcome. So we can see here the declining of the TB, but not very much. We keep the notification about 100,000 cases a year, and we maintain the treatment outcome more than 90% of Q rates. That is uh, quite good, a success, uh, quite good the result of the program. Here is uh, the MDR TB is very important for the TB control. It's a big challenge for the TB control because uh, uh, managed uh, TB, MDR TB, multi-drug resistant TB is very challenging. Uh, in Vietnam, we make the service availability in the own country, uh, own the province. Let's say the nationwide this year, 2017. Last year, we just uh, 51 uh, province, but uh, this year we already coverage 100% uh, of province. We uh, divide the treatment center and the satellite province. Treatment center, that means full capacity for diagnosis and the treatment, but satellite uh, province, only the treatment uh, follow-up. We see the um, treatment outcome is very good. Uh, we can see the um, last cohort, 2014, because uh, they take a uh, two year for follow-up with the 75% of the success rates. That is uh, um, higher than global average rates. And we see uh, enrollment also increase uh, very rapidly, 2015, 2016, 2017, with the number of patients tested uh, with the DST, I mean drug susceptible testing, and the number of the patient in rows for the treatment with second eye drug rapidly scan up. And we intend to this year with the 3,100 patients will be treated with the second eye drug. The next slide. And uh, the new drug and new regimen already apply in Vietnam with uh, quite optimistic result. Uh, last year, we already rose 100 for the beta -quilin based treatment for the pre-HDR and HDR TB patient. And we see here the results. Conversion rates, that means negative after six month treatment with 85% with very high and unchanged regimen with nearly 90%. That means the successful rates will be very good. Of course, now it's early to say the, at the end of the cohort. And the shorter regimen, of the second eye drug also uh, for the uh, MDR-TB uh, patient with a very good result. We see the conversion rate with the four months with the 85 or 86 percent and the unchanged regimen, that means the stable regimen can be followed with the 94 percent. And we see the challenges when we scan up, that is the drug, uh, advert drug uh, reaction uh, as uh, our uh, survivor already uh, tell us uh, recently. Uh, next slide, please. And we see here 
if the trend, let's say the uh, declining of the TB, Vietnam as one among the nine high burden country achieved three indicators of the uh, FDG goal in 2015. And the next slide, please. And this slide show, show us about the declining we wish, that is the targets, and also requirement of the rates of declining. So we see here, uh, currently declining rates is not enough to meet the targets. Uh, please click on, please click, click on, yes. So we see on existing, we just meet the 10% declining uh, per year. It is not enough. It might be we can see the achieve uh, uh, the target, the chosen 20, but the chosen uh, uh, 30 we cannot achieve with the 10% declining. So uh, we um, we need to 20% of reduction of the TB epidemiology. That is, uh, we need not just the existing tool, but also the new tool, that's the innovation of the uh, technology and uh, uh, innovation of the approaches. Uh, we can uh, show you the, the next slide. Uh, this slide, really, we want to uh, share with you. We we want to accelerate action TB uh, control so that we can decline the uh, TB epidemiology to meet the target by the three area. The number one very important that's a sustainable political commitment. We here in Vietnam we have a partnership. Vietnam Stop TB partnership with the more than 40 partner and working together and uh, around with the NTP. We are uh, strictly following the national strategy uh, issued by the government uh, 2014. And uh, now I think uh, the results were very good when we uh, uh, maintain the political commitment based on the national strategy. And uh, next uh, month, the August, we are, we are going to organize a poli policy dialogue along with our APEC meeting uh, in Ho Chi Minh City it is a reinforced a political commitment. It's not just in Vietnam. We would like to have other country, uh, other economy in the, our APEC region. And the next year, 2018, we are already uh, uh, allowed by. Okay. So uh, next year, in terms of the political commitment, we are uh, will organize the conference along with APEC 2018. We are also prepared for the global ministerial meeting in Moscow um, November this year and also the United Nations uh, General Assembly with the high level meeting on the next year. We try to advocate for the strong community involvement and the zero TB initiative uh, in Vietnam. The second area will be very important that uh, optimal use of own existing tune with the three uh, action. Number one, the detect all the TB form as early as possible by the two very important uh, techniques that X-ray expert, we call the double uh, X, that X-ray, chat X-ray and the X-ray expert for the confirmation. We, in, we do the identify case finding in all vulnerable group like household contact, HIV, diabetes, and we apply a new uh, approach, like practical approach to lung health, uh, private public mix, and the practical approach to medicine. We uh, uh, explain later. And the TB treatment, we follow with the precision medicine. That means we uh, test on the TB patient situation of the drug resistance before we provide the regular uh, six month uh, first line drug for the regular TB, that means uh, not resistant. The MDR TB, we apply a short uh, regimen with a nine month second night drug with the pre HDR TB and HDR TB, we apply the beta quinine based. Thank you, Dr. Nung. Now a perfect stage to invite our next panelist, Kavita Ayagari, Head Advocacy, Communication and Strategic Partnerships at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease the Union Southeast Asia office. She has a lot to share today. Kavita, over to you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kavita Ayagiri, 
and I'm really happy to be on this webinar today. So I'm going to really talk about um, can the power of partnerships NTB? Uh, what do we see as the future of this entire goal that we've set, that we're going to NTB by 2030 is what the WHO says. And uh, India has set a task which is five years earlier, 2025, is when our government really wants to endeavor to NTB. But can we really reach there? Is that realistic? That is something that uh, we're going to discuss. And um, that's what my presentation is about. So really speaking, I don't see TB as a disease that cannot be defeated. It's been, a, it's been there for a long, long, long time. But we're living in a time where we have new drugs. We have shorter regimens. We have new diagnostic tools. And we seem to have the WHO and the global community also committed to setting a goal for ending TB. So yes, we are you know, wanting to do the right things. But can we get there? And I really believe there are five things that are essential to fight TB. That is the first of which I think is political will and follow through. So when our political leaders say that we will end TB by 2025, this entire goal needs to be then followed through. Just the manner in which they've shown leadership in other diseases, let's say it's a polio or it's an HIV AIDS, where they've taken steps to end polio, they've taken steps to expedite new research on drugs, to expedite treatment for HIV, can we see the same political will on TP or for TP? And that really is going to be a game changer. So the first of it is political will. The second, I believe, is really partnerships, because there is no way that a government can do this alone. TB has several challenges in front of it. And unless we pool the resources that we have, unless we pool the manpower that is available out there, unless we pool our innovative ideas and forge partnerships that complement one another, I don't think we're going to win this fight against TB. The third thing that I really believe is, which is needed is awareness. So awareness to me is step one. Unless we have awareness, because what the TB program is grappling with is bad consumer behavior. They do not, you know, think cuff or for two weeks is serious enough for them to go to a doctor and get, um, you know, TB treatment done. They do not think that medicine, whether it is for six months or a year or two years, actually, there is a six month period where they're supposed to have the medicine continuously and a lot of people drop out. So awareness is another area, unless we step up the awareness, we're not going to reach there. And this is where I really believe that celebrities, champions, media have a huge role to play. Unless we pull this entire thing, unless we bring celebrities on board, we get media to start paying attention to what are the messages that need to go out there so that people know that this is a disease that can be won over. What are the symptoms? Why is it so important to complete treatment? People are not going to get up and start you know, talking about or knowing more about TB. The fourth thing I really think is research because without new drugs, without even shorter courses of treatment, without diagnostic tools that really discover TB upfront, there is no way that we are going to be able to discover TB early enough and treat TB fast enough for people to recover. So really speaking, uh, if we are to reach this 2035 or 2030 goal that we've set for ourselves, I mean, at the current rate of decline, which is minus 2%, we're going to take a long, long, long time to get there. The decline needs to be faster. And for that, research is essential. And finally, all this is only possible with resources. Without resources, without, you know, apart from government funding, Apart from other private capital being, you know, drawn in for TB and philanthropic funds, impact bonds, other new enterprises and ventures, if that doesn't come into TB, then I don't see this as reaching this goal. So to me, these are the five essentials to fight TB. To me, these are the partnerships that are absolutely essential if we are to end TB. One is the corporate sector, because the corporate sector is a vast resource. They have CSR funding, they have marketing funding, they can do enterprises setting up, they can even unlock small capital for uh, various kinds of uh, 
various kinds of activities which are required for TB. So to me, corporate sector is a vast uh, resource. There's also there also the hugest, biggest employer. So therefore, any workplace policy for TB that needs to be set up is something that can be done through the entire corporate sector. The second to me most important is the private health sector. So whether it's diagnostics, services, private wards, flexi dot centers, social marketing, there are a whole lot of things that the private health sector can pitch in and do for TB. Most of the people and most of the patients access a private health sector, access a doctor in the private health sector. They prefer to go to a doctor in the private health sector. That too becomes our number one reason to go to the private health sector and say, pitch in when it comes to TB. Third to me is research in academia because unless there is a huge student community out there, and unless we have community action or community action by students and student groups where they can also pitch in, and unless we have students interested enough to go out there and educate themselves as well as the masses on TB, that is another area of work that needs to be done. Media and celebrities, like I said, that unless TB becomes number one, unless TB becomes the most important one of the diseases to watch out for, with one person dying every minute, it also still doesn't get the kind of bites that, say, a dengue does or a swine flu does or an Ebola does. So obviously, there is something which is about TB which is not so scary, which is not so top of mind. So therefore, we need to do something with the media so that people get aware that this is a killer, it is a serious killer, and they need to take steps to prevent it. Civil society, to me, is a vast resource, and we just have to tap into it. We started working with Rotary, and what I see as a potential is, in India, Rotary has 37 districts and 3,500 clubs. They also have a number of Rotaract and Interact clubs, which is at school levels. So there, again, is a huge potential of a volunteer force that can be unlocked to work on TB. Parliamentarians. So when we started to work on TB, we felt that do our parliamentarians also know about this being a serious disease? Is it only the health ministry that is concerned about it? What about people's representatives from other, you know, other areas? What about other ministries? And that's when we discovered that we need to go to parliamentarians. We also have the Global TB Caucus and the Asia TB Caucus, which is a dedicated group of parliamentarians who have vowed to kind of bring TB high on the agenda of international and national politics. So we thought that we should have an India TB caucus, which is a dedicated body in India of parliamentarians, MPs, MLAs, elected, non-elected ones. And can they then be sensitized to raise TB to the, at the highest level? And finally, of course, to me, TB patients' voices are absolutely something that we can't do without. Unless you hear the journey of a patient who has survived TB, there is no way that we can um, we can really change the way patients access care or patients get cured today from TB. So these to me are the partnerships which are absolutely essential if we are to win this fight against TB. With this in mind, when our project started, we decided that we will engage with each of these stakeholders and try to bring them in and tell them about TB and ask them to join our campaign, join us and do something for people who have TB or do something in the space of TB. And that's when we decided that when we had done enough stakeholder engagement for two years, we had a summit, we planned a summit. And this TB Free India Summit was really something that uh, brought together a unique force. We had celebrities and MPs. And the idea was through cricket, which is one of the most uh, favorite sports of our country, can we increase visibility for this disease. And uh, really the objective was increased visibility of issue of tuberculosis and then galvanize the vote of people who matter. People who are politicians, people who are MPs and MLAs, people who are celebrities, people who are health experts, state government members, government dignitaries, media and others who are related to the TB field. So this is a small video that I'm going to play. This is about the summit. 
and what it achieved. And the Dharamsala pitch played host to parliamentarians and celebrities for a very special cause. <laughs> Parliamentarians versus celebrities on a different playing field. At the picturesque Dharamshala Stadium, their pledge is to galvanize the fight against tuberculosis. Every Indian should support our fight against TB. Desh jitega, TB harega. I am here to make the awareness. I just hope no one hits a six on my ball. On the field, the MPs 11 faced an early challenge. The only cricketer in the team, Mohammad Azaruddin, sent off due to an early injury. The match is part of a two-day event. The first national summit to fight TB saw corporates and MPs display their resolve. There is a greater uh, sensitization amongst parliamentarians of all political parties that while we do talk about finance and uh, defense and foreign policy, it's very important to talk about uh, subjects such as health and education. We've already connected with more than a few thousands of people, both on awareness and the detection has started. As per the World Health Organization, there were 2.84 million TB cases in India in 2015. And stigma is a roadblock in the battle against tuberculosis. I first wanted to talk about my story with everyone. People advised me against it, saying that TB is in your past. You should not tell anyone that you had TB. Uh, it would create problems in finding prospects for you, like marriage prospects for you. This uh, will help uh, in turn to reduce um, any um, uh, misconceptions uh, that lead to uh, uh, discrimination. Politics and Bollywood coming together on the grounds of Dharamshala for a match of cricket. But the aim of this cricket game is not to defeat the other, but to defeat tuberculosis in India. With Arpit Jaiswal from Dharamshala, Snigdha Basu, NDTV. So basically what was the outcome of the summit that we had that you just saw so a small clipping of? We had various people from government, from health experts from across the globe, celebrities, members of parliament, corporates and media under one roof. And we urged them to make a commitment for collective action to end TB in India. We got a letter of support from the Prime Minister of India saying that this is a very good endeavor to bring together various sectors and help collaborate on a disease like TB. So here we have all the corporate leaders who came forward and committed for TB Free India. There were people from Medanta Group, Omkar Foundation, Gale, there were other corporates like DLF and others who came on board to commit that they are going to join the fight against TB by committing resources, by committing action, by having projects of CSR and outreach on TB. Next, please. We had celebrities who came and played. They also pledged their support and their willingness to come forward to combat one of the things which I think is key when it comes to TB, which is stigma. They said that they will not only come out and speak in support of TB patients, but they'll go out of their way to bring this disease and information on this disease, convey this to their audiences, their own supporters and their families. Next, please. These are some of the other celebrities who spoke. Uh, Sunil Shetty, that's Sohail, say, uh, Sohail uh, Khan. Next. And we had global funding agencies like USAID and Global Fund coming forward and supporting us in this summit. So this entire summit was a partnership effort between USAID, Global Fund, and WHO. We also had the union. We also had HPCA, which is Himachal Pradesh Cricket Association, coming forward to support this. Apart from this, there were a whole range of corporate sponsors and supporters who came forward to support all the individual um, expenses related to the summit. As an outcome of this, one of the objectives was to increase visibility. Just the summit got 244 articles across print, online and electronic media and coverage. And that was only over a period of two, three, two to three days because the summit was over two days and this is the coverage that we received 
immediately on the day and after the day of the summit. Next, please. There was huge social media engagement as well. And this is something that we see as one of the prime drivers of visibility, at least in the social media forums. So we had Anurag Thakur tweeting about it. We had, um, we had uh, Mr. Rudy tweeting about it, who's a minister in our skills development. Um, we had uh, Aftab Shivsani tweeting about it. We had various other celebrities tweeting about it. Next, please. And finally, we had uh, Mr. Bachchan, who is our TV ambassador, who has also been a TV survivor. He talked about the need for partnerships and various people to come together in a forum for TV. So I'm going to leave you with a message from Mr. Bachchan, which is the last video that you can see now. My name is Amitabh Bachchan, and I am a TV survivor. And I would like to tell the world that I too was diagnosed with the disease in the year 2000 when I was hosting a very popular show on Indian national television. I had tuberculosis of the spine. My diagnosis took a lot of time and the treatment was long, but I was privileged to have a good doctor and access to good advice, love and support of my family, and I could recover completely from tuberculosis and get back to work. I understand that this is not the case with several others who get TB. Forgive my modesty when I say this, but if it can happen to me, it can happen to you, it can happen to anyone. If my saying that I too have been a TB survivor can help those affected with the disease and give them confidence that this is completely curable, then I would like to say this openly. Here I am, a TB survivor. Unfortunately, people who have had a TB have faced stigma and discrimination and have been shunned by those they work with or seek care from. Stigma only makes it harder for people who are suffering to disclose their illness, making them feel isolated and alone in their battle against the disease. TB patients must not be stigmatized. They must get the support and care they deserve. Only then can we end tuberculosis. If my saying this can help in any way, then I'm happy to lend my voice to the campaign to end TB. I'm with you all in this fight. TB harega, desh jitega. I'd like to just end here by concluding that we really believe that partnerships are and can end TB. That is the only way forward. Unless we bring this entire pool of people together, whether they're celebrities, whether it's media, yeah, whether it's experts, whether it's private health sector, we will not make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. Our last but not the least panelist is Nandita Venkatesan. She works with the Economic Times and is a two-time intestinal TB survivor come patient advocate from Mumbai. She lost over 90% of her hearing due to a rare side effect of a second-line TB drug. In her eight-year-long battle, she first got TB in 2007 as an undergraduate student and then suffered a life-threatening reinfection in 2013. She just recently gave a TED talk on her long audio. Thank you for having me in, in this webinar. Thank you for asking me to present my views as a patient advocate here. I'm a two-time intestinal tuberculosis survivor and I survived the disease in its worst forms. I first had, like it is mentioned in my bio, that I had the intestinal TB twice. Intestinal TB is a relatively rare form of the disease that not many people know about. TB is still largely considered a lung disease and that is not the case. TB of the intestine is increasingly getting common. When I had developed the disease, I was diagnosed late. My diagnosis happened almost three months after I first started showing the symptoms in 2007. I was declared cured in the first time and then the disease resurfaced again in my life 
in 2013. This time the disease wreaked havoc in my life and I had to undergo six back-to-back -back surgeries and all I was in my deathbed basically fighting for my life. I never knew that tuberculosis could be so so dangerous. No one ever told me this. The lack of information among patients is very high. When I was battling the disease, I didn't know what is the disease about, what, else, what should I be doing, why are the medicines I'm taking so toxic, what am I supposed to do? The lack of information among patients is, patients is an extremely grave problem today. So consequently, I lost around 90% of my hearing. I'm profoundly deaf. I lost my shock to me. I never expected that I would lose my hearing. No one had told me before that that the medicine has side effects such as this. Nor was I counseled after I lost my hearing. So the whole thing came as a bolt from the blue. And today when I speak up, I I ask for the fact that TB is a disease that affects the youth. The maximum, the persons who are affected by this disease are the productive ages from say 15, 16 to your 50s and 60s. The most productive period of your life is when people get affected by TB. And when we, as my country in India, we we boast a lot about our demographic dividend saying that India is a youth country. I want to ask here, how can we claim to be a youth country when the youngsters are falling ill dime a dozen? We have the largest TB population in the world, the largest TB patients in the world, and yet we speak about having a demographic dividend. When youngsters like me have fallen ill and have fallen prey to the disease, where we have had to succumb to the disease in the worst forms, First, I lost my hearing. The economic impact of the disease has been huge, huge in my life. We had to sell off our house. I lost my family savings. I lost around five years of my wages. My mama had to stop working so that she could tender to me. What are we speaking? As we collect here and I attend this webinar, I urgently say, that there is a need for less toxic drugs. There is also a need for a shorter regimen. It's extremely important that we have shorter regimen in for TB. We need to have lesser side effects. The side effects, more than dealing with the disease, dealing with the side effects is what is the worst part of TB. Whether it is me in my case, whether it was losing my hearing and consequently I also lost my speech abilities. I'm speaking here today but the fact is that two years back I used to face problems while talking. Because of my hearing impairment, my speech abilities had also got affected and I was under extensive speech therapy for a very long time. I was not able to speak properly. My speech abilities were completely tampered with. And I was having severe case of kidney malfunctioning as well. On top of it, a bigger problem for TB survivors is the inability to speak up about their disease. Because there is so much stigma surrounding this disease. When I got the disease for the first time, in 2007, my doctor had strictly warned me that I should not be talking about this disease to anyone. Consequently, many people have warned me that you should not be talking about this disease. Don't go open about it. We don't know how people are going to react when you say that you're going to, you have had TB. Oh, maybe, maybe your prospects in life may dim or that you may not be able to find a suitable guy for you. These have been some of the vague responses I've got. It is, it is, we are confronting with a crisis that is not just pertaining to health today. It is a social crisis. It is a crisis that has engulfed the society at large. It spares no one today. 
TB was known to be a very poor man's disease at some point of time, but consequent lack of neglect among governments have meant that the disease has engulfed in the worst form today, eating up young, old, and new, rich, poor. It differentiates no one, and I'm probably the standing example of it. That coming from a middle class family. I have not been spared, and I have had to succumb to some of the worst forms of the disease. I only hope that today me speaking up about it will make the panelists understand the gravity of the disease. That it is a very, very, very difficult disease to deal with. Thank you, Nandita. And uh, I'm just typing in my thanks to her. And now we begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. The open session begins now. There's a question from Shashikant Nayak, India, and the question I think is for Kavita. Uh, Shashikant wants to know: Does India have adequate strategy and funding to end TB by 2025? What are the three quick actions India needs to take, and who is to take those actions? In my opinion, I think the three things that India needs to prioritize really is one is political will. So to me, if the prime minister takes notice of a disease that is going to have an economic impact in the future because it affects mostly people in the economic, uh, in the productive age group, which is 15 to 45 and mostly men. And the fact that uh, these are mostly workers whose lives are getting affected by TB and of course their families because the, if when the main breadwinner gets affected, the family gets impacted completely and you heard Nandita's story. Um, this is when a child gets impacted, how their family was, uh, you know, uh, completely uh, devastated and what all they had to give up to get her treated. And imagine when the main breadwinner also gets impacted, what happens to the family? So to me, first is political will. I believe that along with the health minister who has really shown a lot of commitment and dedication towards taking this disease and, 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 and really making sure that it ends in 2025, I would really hope that the prime minister takes note of this disease as a major challenge and allocates to it a priority like he has done with Swachh Bharat. To me, that would be really fantastic. Second, second step, which I feel which is very important, is awareness. Because I feel that unless people know, and you heard Nandita again, she had no information about tuberculosis being so devastating. So unless people know and they have information on the disease and they're worried about it, they are not going to go and report a cuff uh, and get a, themselves tested for TB. They are not going to get themselves, you know, to complete the treatment. They're not going to realize why they need to complete treatment. So to me, awareness is critical information that the disease is something which where the government has free diagnostics, free treatment, free drugs, that is also not available to people. So people end up spending so much money to get themselves treated. So to me, information awareness is a second critical pillar. And third, I believe is private sector health sector engagement, because there's a huge private health sector out there. And uh, the government is doing its best but I believe it is time for the private health sector to really take note of TB as a disease that they cannot not be a part of the government program. But they have to partner with the government and uh, find solutions such that the patient gets quality care, access to the best treatment, best services, gets the free drugs that the government is trying to provide and gets standard, a standard TB care. I mean, because I know for a fact that there is different different practitioners can follow different regimens of treatment and that too is not correct. So therefore, I think these are the three priority areas of action for our country. One, political will, two, awareness and information, three, private sector, private health sector uh, engagement. And really for everything to happen, I think resources is like, to me, a running theme. Ultimately, all this should unlock a whole lot of resources for combating TB. I would just add four, and that is resources. Uh, thank you, Kavita. 
And that brings us to a question from Dr. Barun Santra of West Bengal TB program. He wants to know what percentage of TB patients are treated in the private sector in India out of the total cases. Basically, I mean, I would say that uh, the government, the TB report that we get or the national report on TB, annual report that we get on TB is the numbers reported by the government. Okay, notification from the private sector has been very small, very low. So if you really look at number of TB patients reported from the uh, private sector as notified to the government, it is small. But if you re but that is because there is not enough notification coming in from the private sector. So I would believe that in the current report, it looks like government is treating maximum number of TB patients and a small number of TB patients are being treated in the private sector if you go by any national government report. But that the reason for that is because there is very little notification from the private sector. The government has also said this. They've said that there are more than a million missing cases. When we say missing cases, we mean all those who are getting treated in the private sector but not getting notified to the government. So if that answers the question. Okay, uh, thank you Kavita. I, I would just like to add on a little bit to that, that uh, as per RNTCP data of the 2.8 million estimated TB cases in India in 2015, uh, 1.42 million cases or 56% percent, percent were registered in the public sector. Uh, and out of the, of the rest, 44% of 1.27 million TB cases, we presume they were treated in the private sector although only 0.18 million were registered by the private sector. But a study based on the, uh, based on the volume of TB drugs sold in India and which was published in the Lancet shows that the private sector in India treated perhaps more than 2.2 million patients in 2014, which is perhaps two to three times higher than what is currently assumed. Uh, so that is true that we still do not know the exact burden of uh, uh, TB patients being treated in the private sector. Uh, we have a comment from Dr. Jagpal Suri uh, who says that my concern is diagnosis of tuberculosis. This is becoming more difficult with the emergence of MDR and XDR TB and the job of a doctor becomes more difficult. We need to diagnose TB and also need to diagnose whether it is XDR or MDR. We are having better tools for all this, but whether we reach, we can reach to all on the ground is a big question mark. If we are not able to diagnose all cases of TB and also diagnose drug resistance, we will not be able to assess the tubercular burden here. And even expert consultants find it difficult to diagnose fossi bacillary, pulmonary and extra pulmonary TB. So the job of eliminating TB is huge that we all agree to. Uh, there is a question uh, for Kavita from Dr. Arshina Trivedi. Uh, she wants to know with awareness we will be able to increase demand, but are we prepared to meet these demands? Is there also need to strengthen our health system to end TB and what is the strategy which has been thought and planned out? I agree with that. With more awareness, with more information, people are going to start asking or questions probably wanting to go to the government sector and asking for services. But I think that is a really good step that is required. The government can also come to know exactly what kind of services to provide. I mean, there are cases in which, you know, government services have, you know, because of the demand, they have provided more. And I think that is really the way forward. So I actually believe that health system strengthening as a result of increased demand would be wonderful step. And uh, the government, I'm sure, has a strategy for it because they have a national strategic plan. They have a vision for ending TB by 2025. And they've thought through that what is required to really strengthen the health system to deliver. Right now, if there is a case of MDR TB or, 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 or XDR TB, I mean, the government is the best place to go, really speaking, right now. But we would really like that to improve so much further. It's not as if saying that, you know, it is the best, it can get better. 
So I would say that yes, health system strengthening is one of the ways. Increased demand is going to create a demand for better health systems, better services, more services. And uh, I think um, that is really the way forward. And the government has a strategy for it, which is there in the National Strategic Plan. And for all this to happen, again, I would say one thing, which is resources, because the government cannot strengthen the health system unless more resources are made available to it. So the program definitely needs more resources. Uh, thank you. And that leads us to the next question, Tarika, which is from Dr. R.K. Sood. Uh, who wants to know what can be done to increase resource allocation to ending TB by 2030? So, so where do I think, resource? <laughs> I think there are there are say, various strategies. Look at the way Swachh Bharat has managed to garner so much funding for itself. There are various ways in which we can unlock both private as well as public funding for TB and donor funding as well. I believe India with the focus uh, with this disease being so high, the 2.8 lakh um, you know new uh, cases every every this you know every year is what we're saying annually 2.8 that is a huge number and i think uh, what needs to happen really is that therefore we need a strategy for you know for finding new resources for tb so one of course indian government resources but allocation to rntcp needs to be much 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 higher what can make that happen i think the government already has a national strategic plan which is a costed plan, and they have asked for more money. So that is one. Two, there is a huge amount of CSR and other funding available and is out there. So that needs to be unlocked a very little. I mean, I, uh, I was going through a presentation which said 16% of CSR resources go for health. So, you know, we need to increase the kitty that goes for health. We also need within the 16% the allocation to increase for TB. And how can we do that? We have to make people sensitized. We have to make various corporates aware that TB is such an issue that they need to start allocating money for TB. And third thing which I feel is that uh, is, is really, uh, you know, philanthropy and other ways in which we can contribute. Because like you heard with Nanika, there are a whole lot of patients out there who need support. And we have a country full of a lot of people who do philanthropy at various levels. To me, Supporting an MDR TB patient or supporting a BPL TB patient can go a long way in not only ensuring that he has, you know, the kind of resources he needs for the long period of treatment, and also he has the support that he requires even for his family. So a lot of things that the government has started, like a social support program, a nutrition support program, can be something that private citizens can take up and support. To me, these are the three ways in which we can unlock funding for TB. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Roger Pauls, CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Health Times Africa, who is based in Uganda and is a TB survivor. Uh, Roger says, it is clear to all of us that the media is key in shifting the paradigm in ending to the end the TB strategy. What media agenda are we fronting towards for awareness in ending TB and how well can media play this role? Pita, you have roped in many celebrities. Uh, what is your take on the media? So my this thing on the media is that, you know, while media highlights what the government is doing or not doing, I don't think enough is being done by the media to really make the public aware. Okay, the, the people who need to be made aware are the people who access the one rupee newspaper, the local, the regional newspapers. It would be fantastic if the media decided to report on TB regularly and they talk about the symptoms, they talk about the treatment, they talk about the importance of adherence, they talk about who to access, who not to access, what diagnostics need to be done. I think there's a lack of information that can percolate down to that level, at an urban slum level to a poor migrant laborer looking for information. You had Nandita who's an educated young girl you know, she was in college, she's working, she doesn't know about TB. Now just imagine the status of a poor person who's earning his living, may may not be literate, most likely definitely can read at least newspapers and things, but we don't know that. We don't know. We know for a fact that a lot of people in our country don't, are not able to read. So 
how do we ensure that information really percolates down to that level? And I think the media has a huge role to play, whether it's local radio, whether it's community radio, whether it's national television, whether it's mobile, because everybody has a mobile. And, uh, you know, we've seen the use of mobile very innovatively during political campaigns. So I believe that all this media needs to play a huge role in ensuring correct information on TV. Correct information on TV percolates down to the poor laborer, poor person who may not have this information and therefore doesn't understand the seriousness of ignoring a symptom or seriousness of not having, you know, a pill today or turning up at a doctor when he should be. I think that is very, very, very important. So to me, media has a huge role to play. And they really have a role to play at this level. And I wish companies who are media companies can, will come forward and say that, you know, I would like a campaign. I would like my campaign to reach the last person, to reach the person who's, 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 who's probably got a prepaid mobile, may not be able to read or write, but at least can listen and hear what we have to say and tell them about TV. Thank you, Kavita. And I think we need, it's not only the poor and those who live in the slums, as uh, Nandita's case uh, brings this out very clearly. And in my uh, personal experience also, that the very so-called educated people are also not really aware of what TB is and the consequences of TB. And I would also request the doctors at least to keep the patient informed. Nandita said she had no clue that the, what were going to be the side effects of the medicine and she was ill prepared to deal with them. So that communication between patient and doctor I think is also very very important. So there is a question um, from Vivian who is Star FM reporter from Zimbabwe uh, wants to know how are other countries targeting prisons as part of NTB strategy? So okay, so in prison is the three action very important that mean Number one is the entry screening. Number two, the routine case detection. That means the people have a symptom, go to the health check, and uh, we are enabled to um, to um, microscopy and uh, cherry straight to uh, diagnosis. And uh, we provide uh, number three activity that that uh, active sky finding. We uh, have a stray a car to go to the prison to prison prison and um, um, check the one film every year. Every, every year we uh, provide about uh, 100,000 to 110,000 uh, prisoners have a cherry stray check. And we hopefully uh, the routine um, case detection can uh, uh, strengthen and uh, the active sky fighting can be reduced uh, uh, next uh, next year. And uh, the result is very good with um, the um, reduction of the incident and the prevalence of the prisoner. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nung. There's one more question before we uh, go to Nandita. Uh, Shashikant Naik wants to know, that the treatment outcome of MDR-TB is quite good in your country. What are the contributing factors to such good results? Uh, the good result of uh, this, that uh, I think number one is uh, the network. We uh, make the network uh, very strong. Number two is the involvement of the community. We uh, have uh, the club, the patient club, and also pharma club to uh, support the patient. And uh, we have a standard eye of the regimen, uh, the whole side of the um, PMDT. We are, of course, we have a strong uh, um, expert in, uh, in the field in terms of the follow-up. And we are, um, have a component of the patient support. I mean, we uh, provide some incentive, we provide the food, and we, we provide the transportation support. For the patient, and we have a program for the tracing, the default tracing. So we identify the problem with the patient, um, so that we can uh, get um, more patient uh, come back to the treatment when they are facing uh, very severe drug um, um, uh, adverse drug uh, reaction. Okay. Uh, thank you very much.
We have a lot of questions streaming in, but uh, due to shortage of time, we will not be able to take any more. I'm sorry for the technical issues which occurred. And I'm we sure. would like Nandita to answer the question uh, which has been posed to her. Nandita. Thank you, Dr. Sanam, for your question. I, I lost around 90% of my hearing. When I was first detected with hearing loss. It was around 60 to 70 percent and after that it has progressively deteriorated over the past three years and today I stand at over 90 percent hearing loss. It, I have been fitted with hearing aids but the hearing aids aren't extremely helpful because my hearing loss itself is at a very advanced stage so a hearing aid cannot be a substitute for your original ear, your God-gifted original ear. So my, I do have hearing aids, but they are not extremely useful. They help in one-to-one, -one, face face-to-face conversations. My hearing loss, I have can't deny, was devastating for me because I, I just, it was not just restricted to losing my hearing. It had also affected my speech for quite some time. I had slipped into a prolonged period of depression because you have been used to living with hearing all your life and suddenly you live in a world of complete isolation. Your communication skills go for a complete toss. You can't hear what the other person is speaking and not everyone is frankly cooperative with the fact that you can't hear. So. I, I also feel that had I been counseled maybe post my hearing loss or at least been told that this could be a side effect, maybe I could have coped with it better. But when I was detected, my doctor told me that he doesn't know of anyone who has lost his hearing due to this drug. But I didn't know how to take that. After all, it was a very difficult experience for me. Thank you, Nanda, and thanks to all of you. We now come to the end of this webinar, having overshot the time. My heartfelt thanks to all the panelists and pa participants. Special thanks to the union. The webinar recording will be made available to you all as always. Goodbye and have a good day.